So good morning and welcome back to New Milton Evangelical Free Church's online service. Uh, we are going to pray. Glorious Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for uh, the very fact that we can trust you. Um, you're a God that we can depend on. You're a God that is um, worthy of our praise and our adoration. And as we come to you this morning and seek to spend time together, uh, Lord, albeit in our own uh, living rooms, as it were, we pray that you would be ministering to us, that you would be speaking uh, into our lives and that you would be changing us to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us as we read and sing and pray. Uh, and as your word is preached, may it, Lord, be to your glory and praise this whole service we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. So we're going to join together and sing Behold Our God. Make sure and lift your voices nice and high.
So it's time to go over to Georgia and to Seth for today's children's talk. Hi Seth, are you ready for this week's children's talk? I sure am. I thought today we could have a little conversation all about God's plan. That's funny. I've been speaking to God recently and uh, he's been telling me that his plan for me is to become the president of Antarctica. That's a, that's a really interesting plan. Yeah. I, I wonder why God wants you to be president of Antarctica. Have you done anything to sort of make this plan happen? Um, I mean, not really. I was just expecting you know, Antarctica to come to me. Ah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I'm not sure that's quite necessarily going to be God's plan for you. Sometimes uh, you have to work really hard for God's plan. Uh, just because you know it's going to happen doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Um, and sometimes you don't even know what God's plan is going to be. I know a really interesting story about a woman and about God's plan for her life. Would you like to hear it? Yes, please. Okay, so today's story is about Gladys Alwood. Uh, and she was born over 100 years ago, around 1904. And she was born in England and she was once in a church meeting and the pastor was talking all about missionaries to China. And she thought, that's it. That's what God's plan is for me. I need to go to China to talk to these people. So she went and there was a place you could go uh, and they were sending missionaries to China and all you had to do was just sign up and pass some tests and learn a little bit and then you could go. Right. So she did those things, but unfortunately she didn't pass the tests. Mm. Uh, so they said, no, nope, you can't go to China, I'm afraid. You're not, you're not clever enough. You, you, you just won't be a very good missionary in China. Mm. But that wasn't the end of it, because she knew it was God's plan for her to go to China. So, she uh, did a little bit of research and found that there was a really old woman in China who was doing missionary work, who was looking for someone to come and help her. Someone young who could take over the business and, and start telling all these people about Jesus. So she made her way to China, uh, and it took a really long time to get there, because she had to take a train and a boat, and then another train, and she had to walk a long way, uh, and it was really difficult. But she knew it was God's plan. So she got to this place with this lady, and they were the only Europeans that these Chinese people had ever met. So they didn't trust them. But she had a plan. She decided that if she wanted the people to trust them so that they would be able to tell the people about Jesus, they should set up an inn. See, their, their house was on a, on a long road that people had to travel on for very many miles. So they decided if they, they set up this inn, people would come in, uh, and they could have some food and they could go, go to sleep that night. But while they were there, they could learn all about Jesus. Uh, and it was a really good plan. People started coming and they started coming back and they started bringing their friends. And they all got to learn about Jesus because of the stories they would tell. Wow. So was, so was that it? Was that God's plan? Uh, rest of our life, innkeeper? Uh, well, not quite. You see, a couple years later... Uh, the old lady that she'd gone out to live with died. She mm. fell down the stairs. And Gladys thought, this is okay. This is what I've been training for. I'm going to keep being an innkeeper here. Just because she's dead doesn't mean that I can't continue yeah. my work. But then a little while later, uh, someone came and knocked on the door of the inn. And this man was Chinese, but he wasn't like the travellers that normally came. Mm. He was very official looking. In fact, he was in the Chinese government. Back then, there was a really horrible practice in China where they used to... Um, they used to take little girls, baby girls, and they used to wrap their feet really tightly in cloth so their feet wouldn't grow properly. You see, Chinese people believed it was beautiful to have really small feet so that if the children's feet didn't grow, then they would have beautiful small feet. As we now know, it was a really nasty thing to do because if your feet don't grow properly, then you can't walk properly, mm. then your feet hurt and are really sore. And so the Chinese official said, and they. Uh, he said to Gladys, we're going to stop this. It's going to be illegal to wrap children's feet in cloth. Um, and Gladys was like, good, we don't want any yeah. more children with poorly feet. And he said, but we need someone. Uh, we need someone with normal feet to go around uh, telling people that it's beautiful to have normal feet. And she said, is, is that what you want me to do? And he was like, yeah. You, because Gladys was from England, so she didn't have tiny feet. Yeah. She had normal-sized feet. And the, the Chinese government wanted Gladys to go around to all of the young girls up and down the country and to make sure that their feet weren't wrapped tightly in cloth and to tell them that it was, it was good, it was beautiful to have normal feet. And Gladys thought, this is great. What a wonderful opportunity yeah. to tell people about Jesus. So that's what she started to do. So, so she's gone from innkeeper to... Uh... 
anti-feet rapper. So is, is that now what's bad for her? She's going to be an anti-feet rapper for the rest of her life? Uh, well, for a long while, she did do that. But God had more in store for her. Ooh. One time, the, uh, the man from the Chinese government came back to her and she, he said, we've got more things for you to do. And Gladys probably thought, oh, more people for me to see, more feet for me to unbind. Uh, but no. He took her to the prison and he said, in the prison, that all the prisoners are rioting. They're getting really angry. They're smashing stuff. They're killing each other. Uh, and Gladys said, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, you always tell us that Christians don't need to be afraid because God is with them. So we want you to sort out the riots in the prison. So she, she went into the prison and she asked them, what's wrong? Why are you rioting? And they said to her, well, we, we want work. We want something to do. We're bored. And they said, and we're hungry, we don't have enough food. And so she, she made a plan and she decided that they would all have looms so they could learn to weave or grindstones so they could learn to do stonework. And she, she set in place this programme which meant they could all do jobs and earn enough money so that they could have food in the prison. So now she's a, a working in prisons, is that... Is that what God's plan was? Is that what she's going to do for the rest of her life? Well, she did do a really good job working in prisons, but God had a, a few more tricks up his sleeve. One time, she was uh, walking down the road and she saw a young girl, and the girl was, she was starving. She was really thin because she hadn't eaten anything in a long time, uh, and she didn't have anywhere to live. She was homeless. So Gladys decided to look after the girl, give her food to eat and a bed to stay in, but another day, the girl brought home a different person, a, a little boy, and said, I won't eat as much food if this person can have food as well and somewhere to stay. So one child became two and two became four. And eventually, Gladys was looking after 200 children mm. in her home. Uh, and she did have a little bit of help, but still, what a lot of kids. Yeah. So uh, now, she's, now she's looking after children. Is that it? Is that what God's plan is? Is that what she's going to do? Well, she did look after children for a really long time. A, a little while after, the, um, while she still was looking after all these kids, uh, Japan invaded China and a massive war started. Planes that would drop bombs on people and fire bullets down on them uh, and lots of Chinese people were dying. Uh, but Gladys wasn't afraid because she knew God was with her. She decided that because she wasn't Chinese, the people wouldn't shoot her. Uh, the Japanese people wouldn't shoot her. So she became a spy mm -hmm. for the Chinese government. Uh, she would go behind the Japanese territory and she would figure out what was going on and she would go back and tell the Chinese officials. So what, now she's the, the female 007? Is that what she's doing? Is that, is that it? Well, uh, Gladys was going to continue being a spy, uh, but someone sent her a message that said, Gladys, you need to take the children and escape. And she said, I don't need to escape. I'm not scared. Christians don't retreat. Uh, and they said, look, you need to look after your children. Uh, you're not retreating because you're scared. You're retreating to save their lives. So Gladys had to take a hundred children, because some of them had gone ahead already. She had to take a hundred children with her. She had to leave the region of China they were in uh, because it was fully invaded by the Japanese. Uh, so she had, to, she had to go on a 12 day journey across some mountains with a hundred children and no one there to help her. So were they just in trains and cars and, and planes? Well no, they walked. Walked? They walked non-stop for 12 days and every time a Japanese plane flew overhead they would have to run into the bushes and hide uh, so no one would get shot. Uh, they walked and they walked and they walked until what felt like forever had gone by. Uh, and eventually, after 12 days of walking, and, and I don't know if you've ever walked with a small child, but uh, they don't walk for very long before complaining that their feet hurt. And they walk for ages, but eventually they made it to a safe place. So she could then continue to look after the children. But unfortunately, she was uh, very sick at this point, uh, and she needed medical attention and she needed an operation. Uh, so she had to fly all the way back to England. She had to travel all the way back it, back to England in order to get the help that she needed. Oh, was, was that it then? Was God, God plan over? She's just back in England now, she's a bit ill, but she's going to get surgery, all done and dusted. Um, well, no, uh, because Gladys knew that God's plan for her life wasn't over until she was dead. Uh, she knew that God still wanted her to tell people about Jesus. So instead of going back to China, she stayed in England. Uh, and she was very old and still quite poorly, 
but she would tell everyone she met all about Jesus and all about God and the amazing things he had done for them. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? God's plan, uh, we don't always know what's going to happen, uh, but we know that God does and he is in control. Actually, this reminds me of this week's Bible verse, Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Uh, do you have any idea what that might mean? Well, well, many people think they, they know what's going to happen. They think they're going to plan ahead and this will happen and this will happen. But I think it's saying that only God really knows what's happened and what's going to happen. So anything that happens is his will. Exactly. Uh, and that God is always in control of everything that happens to you, to me, to Gladys and to all of you watching at home. I hope you've enjoyed this week's story all about God's plan and the work he did through Gladys Outward. Uh, and Seth's just going to pray for us to finish. Dear God, thank you that you're always looking out for us. And please help us to remember that you are always in control and it's your will that will, that will be done. Thank you that we can come every day and watch the service and learn about you. And please help the kids at home to feel safe. Amen. So thank you, Georgia and Seth. We're now going to sing. Uh, we rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Oh, no.
So coming up next, we've got uh, Dan reading the Bible for us and Ben and Claire are going to uh, lead us in a time of prayer. And this morning's reading is going to be from Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to the end. I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and of the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. And with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider and the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. To start this time of prayer, I just want to read two verses from Lamentations. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we might come before you and share our hearts with you this morning. Thank you that you love to hear from your children in prayer and help us to be faithful in laying all before your throne of grace. In these uncertain times, we thank you that we can trust in you, Father, and that you care for the world and all that you've created in it. There is so much fear in this world. The COVID pandemic has caused upheaval and heartbreak across the world. We pray for leaders, of each and every nation, that they would look to you for guidance. We pray for the many that are mourning loved ones lost, and remember that you bind up the brokenhearted and you bring comfort in your love. 
We pray for, for those concerned with jobs and work, for those in work and for those looking for it. Father God, we're reminded that our security for this world and the next is in you, in Christ Jesus. We pray for our brothers and sisters, dealing with bereavement, ill health, in pain, either mentally or physically, for those students returning to school, colleges and universities, return to familiar places, but in very unfamiliar times. Pray that you would be with them. And we pray for our church family, that you would give each of us patience with one another, a growing love for one another, and the perseverance to keep on in these challenging times. We rejoice that you, Father God, are an awesome God, who in changeth times, changeth not. We praise you and thank you for your goodness towards us. Keep us anchored in you, no matter how the world shakes. And during these days of pandemic, when fear and anxiety are widespread, help us to fix our eyes on you, the one who gives peace to our souls. We lift before you our nation and ask for your mercy upon us. We pray particularly for our government and those in leadership, that you would turn the hearts of our leaders to you and give them the wisdom they desperately need to make different, to make difficult decisions and govern justly. As we face, as a nation, greater restrictions to try to contain the spread of the virus, we pray for your grace at work, especially in the lives of those facing many very challenging circumstances. And as the autumn gives way to the winter months, increased isolation this will bring to many, O oh Lord, have mercy, we pray, and as the darkness closes in around, we pray for the light of your love to shine more brightly, and for those who know and love you, that you would use your people as channels to bring light into dark places and the hope of the Lord Jesus into the brokenness of the world around. We pray for the church in this land, for church leaders across the nation, that you would give guidance and wisdom in navigating the turbulent seas of COVID-19 with all the uncertainty it brings that they would know the best way ahead to the glory and praise of God. We pray too for our local area of New Milton and beyond. We think especially of those <clears throat> in positions of responsibility, those involved in serving the community in many ways. We pray for our schools, asking that you give wisdom to those making decisions and for teachers, grant them energy, creativity and perseverance to teach in a changing environment. And we ask too for your hand of protection on every child. We think of healthcare workers, sustain them in their daily lives, we pray, in the face of many difficulties and challenges. May they seek you and find <clears throat> the true and lasting peace which is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you reign over all things. You reign over disease and diagnosis, elections and economies, nature and nations. We thank you that we can trust in you at all times. And Heavenly Father, we want to bring to you our, our mission partners, those brothers and sisters who spread the gospel uh, and the good news of Jesus, both in the UK and abroad. We think particularly of, of Africa, for, for those working in Uganda and Malawi, and for those serving you in, East A in Southeast Asia. Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will bring forth the harvest of hearts, one for Jesus. And we think too of brothers and sisters living in countries where their faith means they're persecuted, that their liberty and even their lives are sometimes in danger. Father God, we pray that you would strengthen them, that you would remind them you are an everlasting God with an everlasting love. Father God, for us here, we would pray that we would be bold in our personal witness to friends, to colleagues, and to those we meet, knowing that you will equip us for your work. We thank you that recently we've been reminded in the children's talks of, of those who have gone before us, brothers and sisters, who have served you in different lands and at different times, each with different gifts, but each looking to serve you with them. And we pray, Father God, that we would recognise the gifts you've given us and use them for your glory. We lift before you our church fellowship in New Milton, thanking you for it and asking that you would strengthen our faith and bind us together with cords of love. We thank you especially for the online ministry, the thoughts of the day, 
through which we have been so faithfully encouraged and strengthened by your word. We pray that hearts and minds would continue to be engaged and stirred by what they hear and pray you would use these messages in the lives of many for your praise and glory. We, pr we pray for the return of our children and youth groups, that your Holy Spirit would be powerfully at work, that the truth they hear would bear fruit, transforming lives and bringing glory to your name. Lord, we long to see lives changed from the inside out by your mighty power at work through your Holy Spirit. We pray for our leaders that you would make the way ahead clear, especially regarding the complexities to do with meeting together. We long to unite as brothers and sisters and to together declare your praises, our Heavenly Father, the one who has um, called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. We pray um, <clears throat> for our pastor, Simeon, thanking you for him and the giving of his time, efforts and talents in the service of our church. We pray you would renew his strength in you and um, he would know encouragement and wisdom as he walks in the fullness of his calling. We pray our church would hold steadfastly to the truth and be rejoicing in it. Help us to be those who continually look to share the good news of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, and we ask for your blessing upon us in his name. So, Father God, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for your understanding of us, knowing our weaknesses, yet giving us your strength so that we might overcome them. We pray that we would delight in you, that we would come to you regularly in prayer, that we would love your word, and by your Holy Spirit power, we pray that you would change us so that we might think less of ourselves and more of you, our holy God. We thank you for your words of life, the truth of the gospel, our eternal hope given to us in Christ Jesus. Father God, help us to understand more of, more of you from your word, from that word brought to, brought to us today, that we might respond in faith and trusting in you, in all t at all times and in all circumstances. And we offer our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing together again. This time we're going to sing, At Your Feet We Fall, Mighty Risen Lord.
looking then this morning at the uh, title of Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we're going to do so from Revelation chapter 16, uh, even chapter 19 and verse 16. Now Revelation is a book which is apocalyptic in its writing style. That means that um, what is used are things that we understand to help us to grasp that which are spiritual realities, to see uh, behind the curtain, as it were, um, in where the Lord dwells and in, in, what he, um, uh, in how he works. In this section that we're looking at this morning, the victory of Christ and his people is in view, um, particularly over the devil and his people. In the thing that we're going to focus on is not so much the victory, although that will be covered, but it's also, it, we're thinking particularly of the victor, the one who leads the people in this battle. Now we're thinking of Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And for us to comprehend such a title is not an easy thing. Um, most of us live in a country where its monarch is little more than a figurehead, um, doesn't really have the powers that uh, a king would have had in the days of old. Um, for us to, to grasp it then, um, we might look to other monarchies around the world, but even so, they don't have the same sovereignty as is in view in this passage. So whatever we would say then, whether we're talking about um, earthly, any earthly examples of potency, um, we, then Jesus would outstrip that by far, and, and so understanding is quite tricky. Now, whether we were thinking of those masters that rule their households with absolute authority, um, we might call them despots or, or, or um, governments that have power over their own country's law or presidents that rule multiple states and control world-dominating armies, none of them have the power, the same power that Christ has, power um, over space, time and matter. This is all within Christ's remit, as it were, without, within his dominion. So Christ is king over all. That's the whole point that we're getting at this morning. Now, if you know Jesus, that might be a comforting thing. Uh, but for anyone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, then they may well find that terrifying to find out that there is no place on earth, there is no power or authority that they can go to, to appeal against Christ, to appeal against what Christ says about them. There is no recourse against his decision. There is no uh, overturning of a verdict that he comes to. He is the supreme ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It says, well then, isn't it, to know the one who may well judge you, or who will judge you, I should say, uh, when you come to the end of your life. It'd be wise to get to know him and to understand um, the, where he comes from and, and, and what, as it were, uh, and the way in which he will lead and rule, uh, because we will be answerable to him. So the first thing I want us to see in the passage is that he is the ruler of all things. That's verse 11. In our passage here, Jesus stands out as the one who, who comes to right all the wrongs and to wage war upon the forces of of evil. He, he is, as it were, the champion on the charger. He comes on his white horse. He comes, uh, as it were, to bring about this great victory. Well, what do we discover about him? Well, there are three particular things that are said about this great leader. First of all, he is faithful. Uh, when, he speak, when we speak of faithfulness, we can mean different things. We might think of, um, we might talk of a dog and say that it's a, a faithful companion. In other words, it never leaves your side. It is always there constantly with you. Well, there is an undeniable sense in that kind of faithfulness being true about the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he is loyal to his people. Uh, all of those that are his, he leads and he delights to do so. He tells us and declares to us that he will never leave us nor forsake us that he will be with us to the end of the age, he speaks of to his disciples in their great commission. Now, other times we might speak about faithfulness and we might well mean that they, uh, the person that we're speaking of turns up on time. They're always there on time or, or, or they're always the one who keeps things going. They are faithful in that sense. So they uh, carry out their duty or responsibility and do so in such a way that you might even talk about them and say that you can set their, your watch by them, um, by the fact that they are on time and do exactly what they say they will do. Well, Jesus Christ is King of, of Kings, Lord of Lords. He has all things in control and he works 
uses all of those things for the good of his people so he's faithful in that way everything is in his control everything is used by our king of kings and lord of lords to bring about that which is good for his people romans eight twenty eight. all things work together for the good of those who love god and accord according to his purpose so here he is king of kings and he is working all things out for our glory now he uses well he can use everything but he uses weather nature he uses governments and rulers of the world he, he even uses the devil um, to bring his bride the church of christ to be spotless and radiant on the day of his coming he is at work faithfully in this world today for the good of his people so he is one who is faithful but we also discover he is true in a sense this simply builds on what we have already said yet without this qualification christ could be faithful in evil you can be consistent in in doing um, bad things well here we understand that jesus is consistent as king of kings and lord of lords on what is true actually to speak of our king as true is to say that he is the truth uh, we're going to look at this evening if you come along to the uh, in-person service we're going to look at i am the way the truth and the life uh, he is the truth he is the standard for what is good and right that is taken from him evil is that which short, falls short of the glory of god that which does not come up to his standard and so we might say that evil is everything that christ is not um, everything that is wrong uh, is not to be found in the lord jesus christ now when you wish to measure something you get a ruler that has markings on it it's got standardized markings so that we can work out how wide something is or how long it is and find out whether it meets the requirements that we have for it or if you build a wall you might use a spirit level to determine whether it is in fact level all the way along or you would use a plumb line to see whether it stands true in that sense well here jesus christ is the standard of all which is true all which is good and we can measure from him everything else so he is not just faithful but he is faithful and true but he's not only faithful and true but he is also just as well there are sadly in our world many travesties of justice aren't there um, you read about them in your newspapers well our judges are easily manipulated our law enforcement can be at times sporadic our penal system is inadequate there are too many folk in prisons and our laws are problematic many of them are no longer based on what god says is right and true and it often seems in, a, in the midst of that situation that the truly guilty get away with murder and those who we would say well were innocent and by that i don't mean that they are innocent in god's sight i mean innocent in the sight of the law or at least they have done something which is um which they've been caught out with they often seem to struggle the most under uh, our judicial system um, because things aren't uh, for the underdog as it were they, these th these things uh, are stacked against them or well, they might feel like that anyway well our king of kings and lord of lords never gets any decision wrong he knows ex everything completely he knows uh, all there is to know about us and nothing escapes his sight you know so because a, a judge a, an earthly judge cannot see our hearts he doesn't know whether we have done right or wrong and so the evidence has to be laid before him and sometimes excuses can be made you know we feel that we have yeah, we might acknowledge that we've done wrong but we did it for a justifiable reason well no excuse will wash with christ uh, no fancy lawyer will be able to spin the actions of his client uh, to get them off with a warning uh, when you stand before christ you stand before the one who leads ultimately and completely uh, he does so with faithfulness and truth but he is also just so everything that is wrong will have to be dealt with excuse me now the evil that is prevalent in our world will be discovered and justice will be done that's exactly what this passage really is speaking to the fact that jesus will come with his uh his angels with his uh, people and he will bring about um judgment well, the second thing we discover is not only is he faithful true and just uh, one that we can depend on and trust uh, to do what is right but he is also uh, has majesty beyond our understanding that comes in verses 12 
and 13. So his knowledge is beyond our comprehension. He knows all things and he sees all things. There's an, the image there is of his blazing eyes. Uh, those eyes speak of his purity, of his holiness, of his altogether other nature. But they also speak of the soul-searching nature of Christ. He is one who is able to see into our very souls and knows all about us. And in his gaze, the guilty fall as dead. That means that every one of us, because we are guilty of the sins that Christ says that we should not commit, then when we stand before him without any mitigation, just as we are, then we will find ourselves falling as dead because he has laid bare our soul and he knows all about us. In the Old Testament, you remember a prophet like Isaiah who falls on his face before the enthroned Christ and recognises that he is uh, of unclean lips. He needs something to have changed in order that he might have a relationship with the one on the, crown, one on the throne. Uh, we also see in the passage that he wears multiple crowns. Now the crowns, to help us to understand his authority, they are a, sup a symbol of his supreme authority, one who rules uh, and rules without question. He is second to none and his rule is unquestionable. Um, actually, as we go on in this passage, we discover that he is God uh, with a name that is unknowable. What do we mean by that? Well, when we talk about having a name, when we speak of a person having a name, we mean that that which identifies a person. Now, for us in the West, that's not quite the same as it, uh, as it is in other countries where, uh, thing, where you're given a name which tells you something about the person. Um, my name is Simeon, it's, it means one who listens. Um, it may well be true of me, but then again it may not. What we might understand it better as is, is to earn a name or to earn a reputation that tells people who we are. So in business we want to get a name for being good at something. Well Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, has a name that is known only to him because it describes him fully. And in truth, he is the only one who can know that. That is what makes him God. He has to have a name that is unknowable by us, otherwise he would not be God. There are things about him that have been revealed to us. There are names that are given that help us to understand who he is. Uh, we know him as Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. We know him as the great I Am, the one who is self existence we know uh, we know all sorts of things about him but we don't know everything about him and so we, there is a name that's no uh, not knowable by us we will spend all of eternity getting to know him and still we will not exhaust who he is so his majesty is in his name his majesty is in what he knows his majesty is in his name but his majesty is also in the clothes that he wears now uh, when you go to see a, a royal um, not so much our queen, she often wears suits as it were, um, but uh, when you see her on her throne she's often dressed in her regal gear. And here we have a picture of this king, this king of kings, this lord of lords coming out before his people and he is dressed in a robe. Now the wonder of this robe or the majesty of this robe is not the richness of its fabric uh, nor the jewels that in it adorn it. Um, though he could have had both of those because he owns, well, everything. He created everything. But it tells us, the majesty is in uh, what it tells us about this king, what it tells us about who we are dealing with. This robe speaks of the king's greatest victory. His death on a cross, where he shed his own blood, where he bore the punishment that was due to sinners, in order that we might be declared righteous. Guilty sinners such as you and I, that we might be declared righteous. So this robe speaks to us of sacrifice. It speaks to us of the one who lays down his life. Now, every sin that his eyes have ever seen, every wicked thought and deed that requires that we be judged and condemned in our lives was taken by Christ and was washed away in his blood. His robe exalts him above all others because he willingly sacrificed his own life to save rebels and enemies and make them righteous. That's you and me. 
Uh, another name that is given in this passage, thinking about his majesty, it is that of the word of God. And now we might come back to that at a later date, so I'm not going to exhaust this. Um, but he who speaks and things happen. He, he speaks and it is so. His, his word is so majestic that it carries out what God wants it to do. Those words cannot be gainsaid or dismissed. He speaks and it is law, we would say. Everything Jesus says is of infinite value. There is no wasted words with God. Not one word falls to the ground and can be wasted. Every word is able to accomplish what he sends it forth to do. The fact that he is God means that when he utters something, it must happen. Um, we only wish that that was true of us, isn't it? Um, you know, we wish that we could say and something would happen. Um, we wish that we could convey a message to another and that they understood that fully. And so often something is lost in, in the way that that message is shared. And, and what we intend doesn't happen. But when God speaks, what he says happens and it is true. It is complete. And so his majesty is declared to us in this passage. The majesty of the king of kings and lord of lords. But we also see that he is... His power is unstoppable. As king of kings and lords of lords, his power is unstoppable in verses 14 to 16. To help us understand the power of the king that we're speaking of, we see that he has an army that is pure like him. They march out in his wake upon the steeds of grace, as it were. They come and they follow him. Uh, wherever he leads, they go. And we read about them that their linen is white and pure. And so Revelation 3 and, 4, 3 and verses 4 and 5 tell us uh, of uh, John speaking to the church there and uh, helping us to understand that he's speaking of people. He is speaking uh, of individuals within a church. And we read this. Uh, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not spoiled their clothes. They, ha they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. And the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot that, out the name of that person from the book of life, they will, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears to hear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there is an understanding that these people that are coming out, that are following Christ, are those who are, who are his followers, those who are saved, those who have been changed. And Revelation 7.14 reminds us that those people are actually those who have had their garments washed white in the blood of Christ. That's a strange thought, isn't it, that blood could wash white? But the whole point is it's about the um, shedding of Jesus' blood uh, shedding of his blood which is able to make the vile sinner clean uh, the imagery is of, of robes um, but the understanding is that that is the internal changing that Jesus has done within us they have an active role in vanquishing in, in the vanquishing of evil as his followers uh, they follow their king bringing down uh, rulers and dispensing Christ's rule as they go uh, so we have the privilege of being part of what God is doing and will do even as he ushers in his new kingdom. We have that privileged position because of what Jesus has done. His power to change and to transform. His power to lead an army that were once against him. Uh, we read also that out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Now that's an odd picture, isn't it? Um, that uh, um, uh, a man riding along with a sword coming out of his mouth, a very strange image. What's it telling us? Well, it's meant to convey the soul-piercing reach of the word of God as it cuts to the heart of the guilty. And we've understood that Jesus can speak and something happens, but here we are now understanding that the power of his word is such that it, when it goes into a person's life, it can get right down and it can see the sin that is so obviously there and it can penetrate and deal with it. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
Um, I've been listening to uh, John Piper's book on future grace, and I have to say that as he has used the scripture, I felt that soul-piercing sword. I felt him uh, remind me of, of where my confidence should be in the future grace in the promise that Jesus will continue to do what is good and what is right for his people, so I can trust him in all things. Don't follow him out of gratitude. Uh, gratitude is not a motivation that the Bible uses. Uh, but what is he, the motivation that we follow uh, Jesus is, is, is by faith. I know that he will do what he has declared he will do. I, I understand it because of his fast his past, not his past, uh, it was past grace, but it's it past grace. We understand it because of his past grace and the way that Jesus gave his life for us. But we also understand that the promises of God's word are true. And so we can fix our lives upon him and we continue to walk forward. You see, the word of God is, is powerful in that way as well. It's able to change us, to chop us about inside and to alter um, our understanding of things. Next thing we understand is that he is so powerful that all the nations of the world are under his rule. Now, it can be difficult to see that in our age, can't it? In the age in which we live. Yet, even today, every nation is under the rule of Christ. It quotes Psalm 2. Uh, you will break them or rule them with a rod of iron and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. The whole understanding is that everything is in Jesus' control. The whole nations of this world are under Jesus' control. And either they will respond to him willingly or he will rule with that rod of iron. Uh, the context of the psalm is, uh, is the whole world conspiring against Christ at his death. Yet God laughing at them because in their hostility, in their evil, in their, uh, in their wanting to get rid of Christ, all they're doing is accomplishing what Christ has said, what God has said will happen. Christ is so powerful, he is in control of everything. And even sometimes it may not look like that, and it may look like evil is winning. You need to understand that Jesus is so powerful, he can even use that evil for good. It doesn't excuse evil. Evil will be paid for. Justice will happen. Uh, but we can trust that Jesus is in complete control you see ultimately all those that raise up their heads against christ be they kings or children they will find that unless they bow the knee unless they uh, understand that jesus is king of kings and lord of lords and come now in repentance and faith then they need to understand that they will meet this king of kings and lord of lords as judge when it is too late for mercy the Lord Jesus Christ's greatest victory was when he made um, us to be right in God's sight, right, right in the Father's sight. And he does that by bearing the just punishment of our sin. And either we acknowledge him as a saviour in that way, or we will meet him as our judge to stand in our own strength. Be assured, Christ's standard as King of kings and Lord of lords is there for all to see. It's on his robe, it's on his thigh. It is who he is. Will you bow now while you still see that symbol as a symbol of hope? That name emblazoned there, Lord of, a King of kings and Lord of lords. Or will you cower as it becomes the ensign of judgment? At the moment, it's a sign of hope. We can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there will come a day when it is symbolic. When it is understood that all who meet this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, will do so in judgment. Where will you be on that day? Who, in whose camp will you be? Will you be amongst those that are to be judged? Or will you be those who have sought the Lord Jesus who has been judged in their place? Where will you find yourself? Is he your King of Kings and Lord of Lords? He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But the question is, is he yours? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that as we have considered Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, help us to understand the extent of his authority. Help us to understand how 
We need to be right before him. We need to bow before him now. Uh, Lord, and for any that do not know you at this moment in time, just open their eyes to understand. Uh, and may they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, the gracious Saviour, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. In his name we pray. Amen. So as a closing song then, we're going to sing All Creatures of Our God and King. So we want to thank you for joining with us this week as we've uh, spent time around God's Word. Uh, we uh, pray that you'll know God's blessing as you continue through the week. Uh, let me just close in prayer. 
Father, we want to thank you for our time together today. We ask, Lord, that you'd help us to understand uh, your plan for our lives and to walk in your ways, uh, acknowledging that you are the, 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 the God over all. And Lord, we pray that um, you might be with us and enable us to speak of Christ in these coming days. For Jesus' sake. Amen.